भीम नमो बुद्धाय नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मा नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मा नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मा so today uh, we are going to look at the uh, last sub part of of the uh, part 3 of the book 4 that is the buddhist way of life that we have been studying for last couple of months which is a very short one but uh, we can begin to look at uh, the sub part number 13 as a very important sort of a teaching that has been included in the buddha and his dhamma and we are going to follow the same pattern as we have been following in this particular book 4 uh, and part to the buddhist way of life so i'm going to read it the verse and then i'm going to uh, come back to uh, the uh, explanation part of it so the uh, sub part 13 is titled as mix not true dhamma with false dhamma so the title itself is very clear that uh, the buddha is uh, always insisting on why not mix the true dhamma with the false dhamma and as baba sambedkar has 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 put it in the in the in this in this buddhist way of life the buddhist way of life also constitutes in knowing what is the true dhamma and what is the false dhamma so let me begin to read and then we will gloss over some of the verses so the verse number 1 goes like this those who mistake false for true and true for false there abides wrong mindedness they arrive not at the truth those who know true as true and false as false there abides right mindedness these arrive at the truth three as rain gets into an ill thatched house so craving gets into an ill trained mind four as rain gets not into a well thatched house so craving gets not into a well trained mind arise be not negligent walk the good way of the teaching who walks in the way of the teaching happy is he in this and in all worlds walk the good way of the teaching walk not in a way in ways that are evil who walks in the way of the teaching happy he lives in this and in all worlds so uh, this is a very uh, as we have seen a very uh, short sort of a sub part and uh, it has been included in this buddhist way of life then we can understand the implication of this sub part number 13 as to how important for all of us who are trying to walk on the on the buddha's way of life is to understand what is the true dhamma and what is the false dhamma now uh, in the previous classes we have seen a lovely classification that has been made by baba saheb ambedkar in terms of adhamma sadhamma dhamma adhamma and sadhamma and in that part we have seen very extensively as to what constitute the dhamma what constitute the adhamma and what constitute the sadhamma so i think this framework that we have studied already in terms of dhamma adhamma and sadhamma is a very important uh, sort of uh, classification of of the teachings you know as to how do we understand what is true and what is false and this particular uh, framework of knowing truth as truth and and, and truth as and truth has been a part and parcel of baba sahib's own life because if we want to summarize baba sahib's life in a few words it's like the exploration into the truth the exploration into understanding what it is whether it's its sociology whether it's politics you you bring any discipline and we will know that baba sahib ambedkar was trying to explore the truth and trying to know the truth as truth that is all, that is not enough but it's also important to know untruth as untruth isn't it i think these two aspects has to be understood very well and baba sahib ambedkar when he wrote the annihilation of caste he quoted the buddha saying that uh, uh, you know to know the truth as truth and untruth as untruth so it's 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 very important uh, for us to know what is false what is wrong 
what is what is what is what is what is not the true what is not in accordance with the truth what is not in accordance with the dhamma and unless we know it it's very difficult as uh, you know uh, baba sahib ambedkar has included here in the very first number verse number 1 those who mistake false for true and true for false there abides wrong mindedness they arrive not at truth so you see always trying to know what is the truth you know this mind that always try to inquire about the truth that always try to run after the truth and, and not mixing true and false you know what is true is true what is false is false isn't it what is right is right what is wrong is wrong isn't it that doesn't mean that you know we we become fundamentalist uh, fundamentalist in terms of dividing the world into two sort of uh, you know spheres true or false you know or right or wrong we don't do that what we try to do is we always try to venture into the realm of truth trying to know what is truth trying to know what is what is false and then we divide that you know and whatever is the right we follow it so this uh, was number one is to be read you know with 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 what we have been studying so far in terms of what is true and what is what is what is false and the verse number two is just an extension of the verse number one in terms of those who know true as true and false as false, there abides right mindedness. These arrive at the truth. So when we know what is true as true and what is false and false, knowing that is having the right mind. And when we have a right mind, we arrive at the truth. Isn't it? So it is not just, uh, you know, declarative uh, sort of a sentence. It's, it's a sentence that means... Uh, you know, one thing leading to another. So the more we inquire into truth, the more we inquire and classify what is true and what is false, you know, we have the right frame of, frame of mind when we know truth as truth, as untruth as untruth. And you see, there is a very important concept in Buddhism uh, when, we, when we study the seven wings of enlightenment, Sapta Bodhanga, you know, Dhamma Vichay. And in the Dhamma Vichay, our, our mind is trying to know what are the positive mental states and what are the negative mental states. And then we bring virya to, uh, you know, uh, further the positive mental states, guard the positive mental states that have already been in their in our minds. And we, we try to uh, not uh, let the negative mental state to arise, arise. And whatever mental negative states we have, we try to diminish them or completely uproot them. So it comes in the uh, the virya comes sati dhamma vichay and 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 virya. So you know why we we have to understand this is because unless we know what is right, we don't know how to follow the right. And uh, unless we have that, we don't have the right mindedness. And when we do not have the right mindedness, we do not arrive at the truth. You see, this is all you know is you know is is all you know cyclic. You know the mind that is running after the truth. The mind which runs up to the truth has a right-mindedness. And when we have that right-mindedness, we arrive at the truth. So knowing, having a right mindset, and then arriving at the truth. Isn't it? So it's very, very interesting. You know, this, this as I told you, that, uh, you know, a single line, if we can understand uh, at length and depth, we can find so much of a meaning there for our lives. You know, a single line can, can enable us to to move forward in a direction that Buddha and Baba Sambedkar wanted to take us, you see. So this uh, verse number second, I'm going to read it again. And please bear in mind when I read it, the framework that I have just laid out. Those who know true as true and false as false, there abides right-mindedness. These arrive at the truth. Very simple, very plain, but very easy to grasp. As rain gets into an ill-thatched house, so craving gets into an ill-trained mind. So if our mind is not trained like this to uh, find the truth as truth, as untruth, as untruth, what happens? Craving gets into an ill-trained mind. Our minds are not foolproof. In other words, our minds are bound to be percolated by the craving. As rain gets not into a well-thatched house, so craving gets, into, gets not into a well-trained mind. Isn't it? So, what is the training of the mind? It's the pursuit of truth. This is the training of the mind. So, if we if we do not pursue the truth, if we do not follow the truth, then what happens? Our minds are not trained properly. And when our minds are not trained properly, they are not guarded mind. They are not protected minds. And when our minds are not protected or guarded, they are like, you know, ill-thatched house. And when there is an ill-thatched house, when it rains, 
the rain percolates through the house and that's how the craving percolates in our mind when we our minds are not trained properly so this was number three and four dhammapad and then also dhammapad arise this is the theme that we have been we have been seeing in buddhism arise try you you know make you know take responsibility move forward don't get struck into something rise be not negligent negligent walk the good way of the teaching walk the underlining word is walk make efforts who walks in the way of the teaching happy is he in this and in all words isn't it so what is the path towards happiness as we have seen that the path towards the happiness that is to the nibbana the ultimate happiness ultimate bliss is nibbana and you know that's that's that is that is the what we can say you know the path towards happiness goes through making efforts you know trying to know what is the truth as truth as untruth as untruth as baba sambedkar has put it in annihilation of the caste with the good way of the teaching walk not in ways that are evil who walks in the way of the teaching happy he lives in this and in all worlds so this is very very self explanatory topic and uh, and uh, you know this 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 sort of uh, thing communicate to us as to what we should be doing in terms of our practice is to know the truth as truth and untruth as untruth and i think that should give us a proper framework to practice the buddha nis dhamma and uh, what i thought today is uh, you know uh, talk more about in the framework of this knowing truth as truth and and truth as untruth as a framework you know to understand how we as the as the followers of baba sahib ambedkar uh, should understand what how how it is to practice the buddha's dhamma so you see um, now you know after after 60 years of you know baba sahib ambedkar's conversion we have so many thoughts going on around dhamma you know if we see a uh, lot of people are preaching the dhamma a lot of people are teaching dhamma and you know in india itself we have we have tibetan buddhists we have we have you know this we have vipassana movement and you know we have this uh, western movements and so on and so forth we have different movements in in this country going on uh, in the name of buddhism and where where do we see we 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 contextualize baba sahib's uh, uh, buddhism and how do we how do we understand it in terms of you know um as 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 a method to know what is important for us and what is not important for us and i think this is very important otherwise i think the purpose of the buddha is dhamma is to clarify for us as to what are our priorities how we should you know practice the buddha's teachings isn't it in other words it doesn't mean that we have to become fundamentalist you know dhamma is dhamma if you go anywhere the dhamma is the same so this question i have been you know uh, trying to uh, you know grapple with for some time and i think i think the answer lies in in baba sahib ambedkar's uh, preface of the buddha nis dhamma where he 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 talks about you know the way of presenting the dhamma so you see uh, there are two aspects one is the uh, the teachings of the buddha as we have seen that you know the buddha nis dhamma is nothing but the teachings of the buddha you know all the you know or if you if you look at from the page 1 to the page to the last page it's all the teachings of the buddha but then there is a way that baba sahib ambedkar has presented it so you see uh, basically in if you if you go anywhere in the buddhist world the teachings of the buddha are going to remain the same they are not going to change shila samadhi pragna that's it isn't it noble it full path that is it if you go at different level then there are different iconographies there are different sort of developments there are many many uh, you know uh, manifestations of buddhism depending on the culture depending on the language people speak so on and so forth isn't it so outwardly we can see that you know there are so many buddhisms you know and we have seen this in terms of nationalities people put the word nationality like thai buddhism cambodian buddhism laotian buddhism sri lankan buddhism tibetan buddhism chinese buddhism we have seen this then in terms of a language we have seen pali buddhism sanskrit buddhism then japanese buddhism chinese buddhism tibetan buddhism and so on and so forth 
And in terms of the schools, we have Madhyamika, we have th so-called Theravada school. And, you know, sometimes uh, some people like the traditions in Burma, they will emphasize on what is called the Abhidhamma. And, you know, other, you know, some people will be emphasizing on Vinaya. Some people will be emphasizing on these. So you see, there is all this diversity of, of, of Buddhisms. And uh, how do we, how do we make sense of that diversity of Buddhism in terms of, 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 I would say the context that we are into the context in which the Buddhist Buddhism in India is unfolding. And uh, so it took me some time to understand why Baba Sambedkar was talking about what is called the Buddhist Bible, isn't it? He was trying to, in a way, produce something that would be of, of tremendous help to us in understanding the Buddhism in a context of, of, of the communities in which he was trying to build the movement. And, uh, and I think unless we have that attitude of, of understanding the, 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 the Buddha and his Dhamma at its core with its presentation and intention, you know, it's, 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 it's very difficult for the movement to spread as fast as it is, it is, it is wanted by Baba Sambedkar. And I think that is the beauty of it. And uh, as we, we, we see that, you know, the study of the Buddha and his Dhamma, it's not an easy book. It's a multi-layered book. It's not an easy book to comprehend. It, it, it's, it's very deep, as we have been seeing from last uh, many months. It's not, uh, it's not something that we will just get it. You know, we have to engage with the book all the time. We have to engage with the different sections all the time. We have to engage with what is called the, 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 the connection between this part with that part. And uh, uh, we have to understand the Buddha and his Dhamma in the context of other books that Baba Sambedkar has, has, has written, particularly two books, you know, the Buddha of Marx and the uh, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in ancient India. And I would, I would go much further into that. I would say that we have to understand the Buddha and his Dhamma in the context, larger context of the, you know, the, the voluminous writings and speeches of Baba Sambedkar. And as uh, uh, Rege, uh, Mr. Rege has said, that the Buddha and his Dhamma is the living monument of, of Baba Sambedkar, isn't it? So you see uh, why I'm saying this, because, because, you know, there is a tremendous sort of amount of confusion. And, uh, and, you know, it's not wrong that there are so many forms of Buddhism that have been coming into play in our context. It's not wrong. I'm not saying that it's wrong or, you know, it's right or whatever, you know. What I'm saying is what, you know, this is what Baba Sambedkar is trying to arrive at. What kind of a presentation of Buddhism? You know, it's like it's like so many facets of a dimension. Uh, you know, diamond. The Buddhism is not having a single dimension. It has got many facets, isn't it? But as uh, the Buddha says, that you go any 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 any. If you follow his teaching, maybe several marks. Uh, you know, but the, the 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 test of the the freedom is the same everywhere. Anywhere we go, the test of the freedom is the same. So my contention when we when we study the uh, subsections like this is to is to clarify for ourselves as to what how do we understand the presentation the Buddhist the, the presentation of Baba Sambedkar, uh, you know of you know so many teachings of the Buddha. And I think unless we understand because you see the teachings are the same everywhere you go any school of thought you go any meditation practice you go in buddhism anywhere you go you know it begins with anapanasati anywhere if it be tibetan be it japanese anywhere you go isn't it people are going to talk about sila everywhere people are going to talk about sila people are going to talk about samadhi everywhere people are going to talk about samadhi you know and pradnya of course and 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 you know so many teachings of the buddha so i think for the aim of uh, such kind of an interaction or reading the Buddha and his Dhamma in, in, a, in a communal way, in a way that is trying to investigate, in a way that is trying to clarify, in a way that is to know the presentation of the Buddha's teachings of Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And you see, when Baba Sahib Ambedkar says that uh, when about Abhidhamma or meditation, Baba Sahib Ambedkar is not saying that it's wrong or it's, 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 it's not it's not Buddha's teaching. Baba Sambhaka saying that this way of presentation of Buddha's teaching is not, not going to help to the Indians. Isn't it? So the way of presentation is very important. This is very important. How do we present the Buddha's teaching? How do we, you know, bring out that framework? 
that is helpful you know to the audiences where it is aimed at and 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 failure to do that is is going to stop the people from you know practicing the buddhism in a way that is helpful to them and helpful to others so that's why we need to have tremendous tremendous clarity as to how baba sa ambedkar has has presented buddhism isn't it as we know that you know he had this this tremendous understanding you know he was as rahul pola has said that he told you know he was told by baba sa ambedkar that he was already a buddhist at the age of 16 isn't it and uh, and we know baba sahib's mind if he if he is if he is if he is trying to know something he will be fully there to know that isn't it he is is a man who will not do anything with a half hearted effort he is a man who will go at the depth of it even to the extent of learning pali to the extent of you know understanding the language inside out isn't it it's not it's not a super superficial approach to learning you know it's not a superficial you know approach to understanding something so coming back to uh, the buddha and his dhamma because it reflects back this section reflects back on the buddha and his dhamma and baba sahib ambedkar's quest to you know present the buddhism in a way that will be helpful to the people that he is trying to you know communicate with and that there lies the tremendous power and the beauty of the buddha is dhamma there lies the strength of the buddha is dhamma as 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 you know as as a powerhouse as 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 a core when activated it begins to make impact on 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 people on so many people and that's why you know in my in my understanding i have found that you know that the community should have this continuous striving to understand how baba sa ambedkar how he presented buddhism in other words trying to grapple with how baba sa ambedkar has trying to create a framework for practicing buddhism and unless we we know that then we are bound to lose you know our directions we are bound to lose lose our our what is called the 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 the, the, the north the true north so why i am saying this because you see you know you know if we study what is happening in the communities after 60 years we have been seeing that there are so many schools of thoughts and people have been you know arguing back and forth that this is right what we are for example if people go to vipassana practice you know it's good it's buddhism people should go do it isn't it people should understand how to meditate there is no question about that but in what context isn't it if we are just taking that into or if you if you are going to for example any any retreat and if you are if you are trying to you know if you are not having the context as to why i am doing this then it becomes very difficult and that's why we are seeing and the so much confusion in the community because everybody is saying that what they are following is the is the only way is the true way this is the true way okay fine this is all buddhism and you know uh, there is no qu- question about buddha's teachings being true or right but you know how do we present them presentation is a key having that framework is a key having that 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 background is a key and if we if we if we take away that background isn't it if we take away that context if we take away that presentation if we take away the aim of why it is done then you know it might not be even helpful to what baba sa ambedkar has been trying to do it might sometimes even be counterproductive productive to what baba sa ambedkar he is 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 taking trying to take forward and this dichotomy that has been put up here is you know that baba sa ambedkar is socio political and you know he has no spiritual you see this this dichotomy that has been created all the time that you know he was not spiritual you know who can be more spiritual than baba sa ambedkar isn't it who can be more grounded in the in the in the, in the teachings of the buddha who can be more grounded in the compassionate action who can be more grounded uh, you know uh, in engaging with the world so for we have to let go this socio political and spiritual dichotomy altogether we have to throw it out of the window isn't it 
we don't have to we don't have to you know take because if we take these frameworks then we are already trying to create something which is in contradiction with each other there is no division between what is called is socio political and spiritual isn't it if had if it had been so the buddha would have not taken efforts to create the sangha the buddha would have not taken efforts to talk to the kings the buddha would have not taken uh, given the sermons on how you know the rich people should be so see the, the the core of the buddhism if we understand is to is to transform the entire world isn't it and that's how we have to begin to understand the presentation of baba saheb ambedkar so I, i i said that the buddha is dhamma in the context of the two books and then in the context of the entire literature of baba saheb ambedkar isn't it so unless we have this method i think we cannot understand how baba saheb ambedkar has presented buddhism in in this manner and if we fail to understand why baba saheb ambedkar has presented buddhism in this manner you know whatever we do in the name of buddhism it might be good for people it might feel make them happy it's good but it might in in the long run might be in contradiction or even you know in, in opposition with what baba saheb ambedkar is trying to do so you see my condition is when we are when we are talking about this buddhist way of life isn't it so buddhist way of life is going to unfold you know in a different way isn't it though the heart and the core of it will remain the same but the way it will manifest is going to be different it's going to be you know vary from you know communities to communities but the attitude of knowing what is true what is false what is useful in the context what is of 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 going to be bahujan hitai bahujan sukhai you know very simple test isn't it if it is it if it is uh, beneficial to the bahujan hitai and bahujan sukhai this is all coming from baba sambedkar i am not adding a single word from my side isn't it i am just trying to explore you know in a in a sense of you know what can be the best uh, thing you know what how buddhism can be best presented so that it 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 is it is it is applicable in our context it is useful for for many 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 people isn't it not for the few people not for the chosen ones you see what i'm trying to say isn't it so i think this is what is uh, you know uh, this how we can extend the discussion further and and we can be open for discussion we can talk to people we can we can engage in a in a discussion with them we can in other words make buddhism very vibrant and that is what baba saheb ambedkar wanted to make buddhism vibrant isn't it not not something you know fundamentalist isn't it he raised the difficult questions he even 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 questioned the 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 heart and the core of the teaching of the buddha the four noble truths so he was not questioning the uh, four noble truths he was questioning the emphasis on a particular aspect that if you if you if you if you trace so much on saying that the world is full of dukkha isn't it and and forgetting the other side of it that you know the dukkha is man made dukkha is a construct isn't it dukkha is a construct and dukkha can be you know you know destroyed altogether and nibbana can be attained isn't it so it's a way of presentation are we going to always talk about you know how our lives are filled with filled with dukkha you know how how everything is problematic It's okay, you know, to know how why the lives are problem, uh, you know, problematic. It's okay to explore it, but are we going to, you know, only only go on harping the same tune? No. Are we going to do it forever? No. Is Buddhism pessimistic? No. Buddhism, as we have seen, is a teaching of the joy and happiness. Baba Saheb Ambedkar is always talking about happiness. He's talking about nibbana as happiness. He's saying that if we get rid of raga dosa moha. isn't it the, the more they are you know they are destroyed within us the more we tend to become happy the more we offload lot of things and you know straight away run towards nibbana at ease isn't it very beautiful presentation if you if you want to talk about in terms of baba saheb ambedkar baba saheb's understanding of 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 buddha's teachings so called spiritual teachings you know it's very 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 clearly enunciated by baba saheb ambedkar so the point here and i think you know i i i i i don't want you know i want the uh, you know uh, the the entire community to talk about this isn't it what is the right way of presenting without you know creating 
the barriers between the people you know what is important for us isn't it how baba saheb ambedkar understood the dhamma how baba saheb ambedkar presented the dhamma you know in what way and where where we can find that best presentation of the buddha's dhamma for us in it's in the buddha and his dhamma and that's why you know the the, the study of the buddha and his dhamma to understand the buddha and his dhamma to 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 grapple with various concepts of the buddha and his dhamma to grapple with the structures within the buddha and his dhamma is so crucial for community is so so crucial and essential for the community without which we are not going to succeed because you know that's you know baba saheb ambedkar has written you know it after a tremendous study after tremendous understanding you know and we have know that his understanding is not wrong you know it works in all different spheres so the buddhist way of life what constitute the buddhist way of life if we ask me to reflect back on this question i would say that the buddhist way of life consists on continuous exploration in our context of the buddha's buddha and his dhamma isn't it so if we if we want to uh, have a buddhist way of life the one of the very important aspects of the buddhist way of life is to have a continuous study of the buddha and his dhamma in our individual lives in our social lives in our community life and in the movement itself and that way of presenting the dhamma is going to be bhojan hitay and bhojan sukhay it will not be a matter of a few handful of people it will be a matter of welfare and happiness of many 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 people so i am going to stop here and i am going to uh, open up the class for for a longer discussion on this and uh, uh, you know uh, you can you can put forward your views because i am sure that you know we are all like you know exposed to you know different discourses within the community without the community outside of the community about you know buddhism what is buddhism you know how we should understand it but my contention if we if we if we remove the buddha and his dhamma from the equation in our context then you know we are heading towards something which is not envisioned by baba saheb ambedkar so let's discuss let's bring out whatever are the viewpoints in the in the in the among among all of us Anybody? Yeah. Yes, I'll come. Definitely, the study of the text Buddha and his Dhamma is necessary. It's necessary to read again and again and study and practice, contemplate on it. Then only we can understand it. We can go into the depth of of it. And mm. in the first uh, and second verses. Hmm. It seems that uh, if the person has no right view, hmm. then you cannot see the things as it as they are. Hmm. Hmm. Right view is the key to remove ignorance. Hmm. Ignorance of not understanding four noble truths. Hmm. That every uh, state, uh, every situation, if a person suffers, has suffering. But he doesn't he recognize that he has suffering, and then he doesn't try to find out the cause of suffering. <laughs> and then, if he knows that uh, he is suffering and cause of suffering, then only he can find the way to remove the suffering. <laughs> so, lack of right view, that is mitta drushti, <laughs> the person is, <laughs> then the, she cannot see the things as they are. He considers true as false and false as true. True, very true. Now the way you talked about right view, uh, other other people will talk about right view in a different matter, manner, isn't it? So, for us, what is the right view? It's a continuous quest for knowing the truth, isn't it? So the right view is not something static understanding of the world. it's not a static understanding of 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 how do we understand the world you know it's ever changing isn't it so uh, so right view if we if it's a continuous exploration of what is what is to, what is the truth it's a continuous exploration the buddhism is a continuous exploration it's a never ending process 
isn't it? That we have attained the right view now and now gone. Everything is finished. It's not like that. Then the Buddha would have stopped doing anything after he was enlightened under the Bodhi tree. Right? So his, his, the, 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 this, this, the teaching of the Dhamma is very much part of the Buddha's awakening. Isn't it? So right view cannot be, you know, uh, you know, separated from right sankalpa. Isn't it? If we, if we take right view just as, you know, standing on its own without right resolution, right sankalpa. That's why when we talk about the pradnya, we club these together. Mm. We club the right sankalpa means the right resolution. And we are going to come to that. How do we resolve? What is the right resolution? Isn't it? So what I'm trying to get it at is, you know, we have this, what Baba Sambedkar has done for us is to have given, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the look into his mind that, you know, you know, continuous quest for knowing the truth. Isn't it? Uh, it's never ending process to know, you know, we, when we are being in the world, it's a continuous exploration. We, we, when we are fixed in some situation, we try to know what is truth and what is false. Even in the mundane situation, in the in the in terms of the conflicts in the world, in terms of the conflicts in the families, in terms of the conflicts in any context, isn't it? So, for example, knowing the four noble truths. Now, knowing the four noble truths, if we club together, because the first noble truth needs knowing, understand, knowing and understanding. The second noble truth uh, truth needs giving up, craving. The third is to hold, bhav. And the fourth is to practice. So knowing the fourth noble truth is actually the putting the, the, the path into action. Isn't it? So even if we unfold this very seemingly simple way of presenting uh, right view as knowledge of uh, four noble truths, if we, if we explore even the four noble truths, we get the uh, sort of a different sort of, uh, uh, you know, attitudes. Because the Buddha says, no the first truth. Try to understand what is the Dukkha. Then, what is the cause of the Dukkha? Leave the cause of the Dukkha, that is Tanna. Detach yourself. Isn't it? Then, experience the Nibbana and follow the path. Isn't it? So, what I am trying to get it at, Alka Madam, is, you know, like, let's have this beautiful text, but have this continuously exploring mind to unfold a lot of this uh, you know, ideas and a lot of these uh, sentences, a lot of these concepts, so that, you know, the more clarity we have of, of the teachings of the Buddha, the more we are going to find that, you know, it is useful to us and the society. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, right view in, in, in Baba Sambedkar, if, if you look at in, in, the, in the Buddha or Marx, the Baba Sambedkar has given the list of what is the right view and in other places, what is the right view, you know, superstition. Is a mitchaditi. Isn't it? Believing in the caste system is a mitchaditi, I would say. Believing any any form of you know um, fundamentalism or anything that is not been tested by our mind. Isn't it? And that's why Baba Sambedkar has come up with very, very beautiful uh, you know, framework that something we know for sure, something we might know in the future, something might, might remain unknowable forever. Who knows? So I'm just talking about the approach or the I don't know, attitude that we need to cultivate. Yes. So anyone, any other person? Namo Buddha, Jabim friends. Jabim sir. Uh, see, once we walk on the uh, path of reading or exploring this book, Buddha and his Dhamma, hmm. very that it is a manual or procedure for upliftment of self, hmm. for upliftment of mental health of oneself or spiritual health. Hmm. or physical health huh. as well as for the society so uh, the mind like Papa Sahib Ambedkar, the great mind he stayed with the principle of Buddhism from his early age hmm. now once he started uh, writing this he studied Buddhism for more than 30 years in his lifetime now once he started writing his book he already walked on the path of Buddhist way, basically. Mm -hmm. he, in his lifetime, he walked on the path of Buddhism. Now he is writing that. So what I feel while writing this, it was for himself also and for the society whom he trusted most. 
I believe it is a mm-hmm. society. He has tremendous faith in this. Mm-hmm. What I see Buddha and his Dhamma as you know uh, a procedure, mm-hmm. casteless and classless, and then venture into the world mm-hmm. and make that world also the casteless and classless society. Mm-hmm. So, this is what the message of uh, Baba Sahib from this book. Uh, this is just a reflection, Mangesh Bhai and team. Right. See, I think the core of it is the conflict. And, uh, you know, there is a conflict everywhere. Conflict within, conflict in the society, conflict in the world, conflict between the nations, conflict between the caste, conflict between the classes. Now, this is a very big problem. The conflict is a big problem. You know, it's everywhere. And how do we how do we find a way towards resolving the conflict? It's not black and white. It's not easy. Isn't it? There are many dimensions to a conflict. It's not a singular dimension to it. So I think uh, what is important uh, here, as you said, is is to first, you know, examine within our own world where we are and we see how these realities can be actualized, isn't it? So the focus in in, in one way, uh, you know, Baba Sambedkar has said very beautifully that uh, that how Buddhism is going to help the movement that he has started. He said, that uh, you know there is uh, uh, there is this, this this dirty water of of brahmanical hinduism which is flowing in our lanes it's it's flowing in our localities and it has it has created tremendous divide in the communities so the buddhism is going to work in a way that is going to divide the divisions that that is going to you know work on the divisions within the communities so that's on the basis, that's, that's the division on the basis of the caste because the dirty water of the Brahminical Hinduism has been flowing in our, our lands, in our alleys, in our, in our colonies, in our, in our localities. The second thing Baba Sambhadkar has said that, you know, there is now the division based on the class which is coming up in, 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 the, in the community itself. That there are middle classes and there are a lot of poor classes among us. So how do we remove this division? So that's where the Buddhism is going to play as to, you know, even if we become, uh, you know, if we economically even advanced, some of us have been economically advancing and some of our folks have been pitch poor, you know, they are very poor. They do not have even the means to make their both ends meet on a day-to-day basis. You know, uh, among us, there are people who feel, who face the continuous forms of discrimination all the time. Isn't it? So for me, the question will be, and this is what Baba Sambhadkar has envisioned, as to how this understanding of the Buddha and his Dhamma, how this, you know, the tremendous legacy that Baba Sambhadkar has left behind, to make it applicable to the context in which we are all into. Isn't it? How to, how Buddhism can, 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 can cover the gap, rising gap between the rich and the poor. Isn't it? Now there is a, uh, you know, middle class among the Ambedkarites. Then there is a few class which is pitch poor, living in the slums and uh, and and you know the in the in the in the villages. That's another class there. Then within us there is a tremendous division, you know, based on the caste, isn't it? Based on the sub caste. Now these are not the mundane matters. If we can work on these issues, we create something for the world that you know that will astonish. People, you know, can we forge a community? Our circumstances are more difficult than we can envision or imagine. Isn't it? The circumstances that we are, you know, the poverty, the discrimination, you know, not only, you know, a singular kind of a discrimination, multiple levels of discrimination. This is a complex situation. If we can make Buddhism work in this complex situation, the way Baba Sambedkar has envisioned, you know, we are already there. We produce tremendous amount of, you know, ideal. We produce tremendous amount of, I would say, not to use the word for the sake of it, energy, aspiration, inspiration. In fact, the community has already started doing it. You see, after 60 years, the Buddhist community is completely separated from so-called the caste Hindu community. In terms of the rituals, in terms of the symbols, in terms of the way we practice, you know, we have completely taken a break away, isn't it? Like uh, uh, Savarkar used to used to argue that you know this community, what is this conversion? After a few years, this community will be assimilated further back into the so-called Hindu community. It didn't happen like that, isn't it? 
the, the community has taken a very you know slow break up isn't it now it is it's completely a different community it's culturally different community its symbols are different isn't it and people are observing that their festivals are different you know they are they are cannot then they can no way be classified in the so called hinduism can they be isn't it so it's a, it's a slow process but we have to actualize the process in other words we have to grapple with these big problems you see pankaj what i'm trying to get it at yes 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 that is <laughs> well interesting thanks to baba sir thanks to baba sir yeah rahul here rahul bhai jai bhim jai bhim uh, <clears throat> just wanted to so focus on one thing which you quoted uh, that re- Uh, this so few people were alleging baba saheb that uh, his religion is political hmm. so the reason actually the other people was saying uh, like this because they do not they restricted the religion only to the spiritual things yes and baba saheb was relating the, the religion to the uh, spiritual thing as well as to the society as well as to the politics Means even uh, in one quotation he said that buddhism was a democratic movement which upheld democracy in religion democracy in society and democracy in politics beautiful and he said it uh, and i think the main purpose of giving religion to the indian people is to protect the democracy hmm. that was a very noble intention i can find behind his uh, decision mm-hmm. and the reason uh, means there is a, an, another supporting quotes from him uh, mm. means we can uh, directly relate mm. this mm-hmm. that he said that mm-hmm. uh, if fraternity is not there there is nothing to build democracy on mm-hmm. why did democracy not grow in india mm-hmm. that is the main question the answer is quite simple the hindu religion does not teach fraternity Hmm. instead it teaches division of society into classes or varnas and the maintenance of separate class consciousness in such a system where is the room, room for democracy hmm. that is mean religion is directly related to politics hmm. yes so yeah very rightly said that you know the very narrow view of looking at buddhism and the way baba sambedkar has always trying to expand the scope and the the the, the reach of buddhism in terms of when he talks about dhamma and religion he says that the buddhism is not religion the way the you know the people have been you know t- trying to talk about buddhism then what is buddhism what is buddha's teaching is dhamma what is dhamma then you go on exploring what is dhamma isn't it then he says that, that what dhamma is so fundamentally and essentially social so he is not talking about society as such he is not talking about community as such he is talking about the nature of the dhamma as social when it comes into play when there are two people two human beings when there is a community of the human beings isn't it and the dhamma as the the the, the principle of governance very very you know you see you see if you peel over the lot of layers you begin to see the the the, the beauty of the dhamma the tremendous scope of the dhamma the kind of impact that the dhamma can have on the world isn't it and then there there is not the baba sambedkar is not you know trying to tell us not to be individual responsible he is always saying awake arise do it you know p- p- perform your 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 work don't be complacent complacent don't be you know uh, what is called you know sweet mouthed all the time it's very very tremendous sort of a way and that is how you know the light of baba sahib ambedkar shines through in the buddhism isn't it the point is i would say continuous exploration studying i would like to see that there are there are the study classes on buddhism everywhere isn't it people from all backgrounds sitting together talking about the buddhism exploring the sentences the chapters you know trying to completely turn it inside out you know make that light available to everybody so raul you are right in that perfectly right isn't yeah, it and i think being a buddhist it is our duty to means we are protecting the buddhism but mm-hmm. we are also protecting the democracy because yes. whatever religion is prevailing in india 
that is against democracy and it is our responsibility to spread buddhism in that context that is to protect the democracy as well because what baba saheb has said if in the current situation if any political party will come into power which supports the democracy but it will not rule long because the current society is not supporting that attitude true so that's a very i mean we have a very big task with we us. have a big task that is we have a big practice of the dhamma yeah <laughs> even means uh, many people from our community are fan of osho but he was uh, criticizing ambedkar and he said his religion is not a religion his religion is a politics that's what you know that's this what, all people yeah, are yeah. talking about you know in order to sell their uh, teachings i call this yep, you know yep. thing you know trying to sell your your teachings isn't it yep by saying so sometimes we you know people i found appropriating baba sambedkar to put forward their teachings you see so is, this is a very interesting situation i would say this is a very inter- interesting situation there is a way out of it there is a very beautiful way out of it you know and that is the buddha and his dhamma and uh, you know this this book is going to be our i would say our you know our our uh, protector i see the protection of a community in this very book now people might take it to the other end but i would say that you know this 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 has this has this tremendous amount of power to save our our people to save even the world yeah the panacea yeah yeah panacea and pan world when you are talking about democracy yeah, yeah. when you are talking about the western world how yeah. do they understand what is democracy through this correct the framework humanistic framework anybody else rahul thank you that was a very nice comment anybody else as buddha used to say that i have experienced this and then uh, i am telling this so go by this way so and uh, baba saheb was bodhisattva only we are lucky enough to learn buddhism directly from bodhisattva good 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 very good comment and through this book only good good, good. from buddha and his dhamma good shashank Jai Bhim sir, uh, so so wonderful discussion is going on. I'm like, like you know, trying to hold my nerves how I can express myself. Please, so please. now I got got an opportunity. So uh, I think in our Buddhist society, if we exclude Buddha and his Dhamma hmm. from our movement, from our social movement, individual, political, economical, whatever the movement we are doing, I think it will be very tough for all of us if we exclude this Dhamma from uh, completely because. A lot of people like trying to strive for the social movement without having a base of dhamma. Mm-hmm. They're trying to have the political movement without having the base of dhamma. They're trying to have the individual, a personal level of uh, upliftment without having the base of dhamma. Mm-hmm. I think I think the Baba Sahib here trying to you know give us a wonderful Bible. I can say to have the base how the Buddha and his dhamma will solve our personal social. political economical problems mm. and then how we can practice and how we can be a modern buddhist in the today's 21st century so this is the solution i can say that because the rahul uh, sir sergi said that in our know, democracy we need to save the democracy but i can say that the buddha is dhamma the chapter number 1 his kula is describing the democratic uh, world in the buddhist era mm. when he was like trying to say that you know uh, uh, in the first way that there is a Uh, there is a monarchical state and there is non monarchical states there and there were many ruling families in the republic of the sakyas and they ruled in turns so it means that there was a democracy there were some sort of a way the people used to come and rule in a turns so baba saheb has given us this democratic uh, i can say uh, model and also the individual society and the uh, and the economical model we have and this buddha is dhamma has to be in context of every movement mm. we cannot neglect that mm. and coming back to the exploring exploration the way of uh, uh, the practice of you know uh, exploring the dhamma exploring the buddhist way of life i will i will definitely you know give uh, our wonderful ideal siddhartha the way siddhartha explore the truth the way siddhartha go to alar kalam what is the truth he goes there at brigus ashram he goes at trial to a severest sort of ascetism mm-hmm. 
six years he practiced and he was ready to die for the truth hmm. that kind of attitude he he like you know uh, was very 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 so much you know i can say he has a so much hunger to know the truth hmm. and that kind of attitude if you explore ready to die for the truth very true and then that's that's kind of a way and then he find ultimately find his own way true yeah and and then at, at the at the last i just want to like to say that uh, at the introduction of the baba sahib said that if life is sorrow death is sorrow rebirth is sorrow then there is an end of everything hmm. neither religion nor philosophy can help a man to hmm. achieve happiness in the world so i will definitely say that baba sahib is emphasizing us to have the happiness how the buddha is dhamma gives us happiness in the world because world is suffering today even though if we are like living in the 2023 we are still suffering but then we cannot just talk about suffering we need to talk about happiness hmm. and how the buddha is dhamma can uplift the world to give the happiness so this is the uh, my uh, feeling i wants to uh, say thank you thank you sir thank you thank you see uh, what i you know the, the analogy that i have been uh, trying to put forward you know the buddha the buddha and his dhamma at the center of it and then the two books that baba sahib ambedkar has you know immediate background of it and then the entire gamut of uh, writings of baba sahib ambedkar including the constitution of india and you know all the way starting from his paper on the caste and the, you know genesis of the caste you know this is the one dimension that you know we can explore the another dimension that is there is that you know buddha is dhamma becoming like a lens where the all the energies from the tripitaka is being focused converged there you know whatever best there is in the buddhism is converged there for us isn't it so you see this this these two dimensions of you know uh, bringing uh, you know understanding the buddha is dhamma is very important you know i i would never discount anybody to you know discourage anybody from not to read or practice in any other schools you know there are so many so many things they are coming up if you go to the internet you know so many talks on buddhism buddhism is a well represented uh, the most represented religion in the world if you use the word religion on the web you know if you see there are so many discourses so many books you know not a day is passed when the book on buddhism is not released so much you know it's like a explosion isn't it it's, it's exploding so many teachers coming so many people talking so how do we make sense of that if we do not have this lens of buddhism you know it will it will create confusion layers of confusion here there all over the places that's why you know to have a centrality of a of a of a book like this isn't it is of so important it's is of a tremendous importance to know you know how where we should find that focus where should find that lens by which we can examine everything so thank you shashank that was a very insightful comment and i think we have just one minute left or maybe two minutes left or if anybody has anything any passing thing to comment on or anything that they would like to comment on please go forward for the next two or three minutes if not then what i'm thinking is you know from the next class onward because we are now going to finish we have finished this buddhist way of life and i have deliberately taken a lot of time in order to you know read go through this uh, we have slowed down our classes and we have gone line by line when we were uh, studying this section of the buddha and dhamma the next is also very important the sermons of the buddha and i would like this format very much that i talk about 20 30 minutes and then for the next 30 minutes we discuss because i find this format very interesting so um, that is it for today and we will meet next week with a new uh, new uh, part part 4 of the book 4 of the buddha dhamma till then jai bhim and see you jai bhim jai bhim thank you thank you jai bhim sir jai bhim jai bhim